the orientation and mobility instruction of someone who is blind or visually impaired has many components. The one we are going to discuss today is the sighted guide technique. The footage of this video has been shot as part of a class project that my friends and I did during our master's degree. Have you been in a situation where you have had to assist someone with visual impairment but were confused whether to walk in front of them and ask them to follow you or stand next to them, stand to their right or to their left, hold them by hand or shoulder? Well, there are certain professional techniques by which a sighted individual can assist a visually impaired safely and efficiently. The sighted guide technique refers to a method by which a visually impaired person and a sighted person can walk together safely and comfortably. Most people who have low vision or are blind have had to travel at one time or another with the assistance of a sighted guide. Even someone who normally is able to travel independently with a cane may take the arm of a sighted companion occasionally. When walking with a sighted guide, a person who is blind or has low vision walks a half step behind and to the side of the guide while holding the guide's arm just above the elbow. In this way, the person being guided can feel and easily follow the guide's movements. The sighted guide technique requires minimal amount of practice to master. The technique has different aspects which the guide and the follower must keep in mind. Let's have a look at all of them. While sharing the following techniques with you, I will refer to the sighted person as the guide and the visually impaired as the follower. The first aspect is that of contact and grasp. The guide has to touch the follower's elbow, forearm or hand with the back of their hand. The follower should grasp the guide's arm above the elbow with his or her fingers on the inside of the arm, near the guide's body and their thumb on the outside, near their own body. A firm grasp should be used without putting excessive pressure. If the follower is a child, he or she should hold the guide's wrist. If the follower is in need of physical support, then the guide can bend his or her arm at the elbow. If the follower is much taller than the guide, he or she should place his or her hand over the guide's shoulder. The next aspect is walking up or down stairways. The guide must stop just before the stairs begin. He or she must inform the follower whether the stairs go up or down. The follower must be allowed to use the handrail if possible. The guide must move his or her arm forward bringing the follower to the edge of the stairs. The follower will be beside the guide. The guide must step onto the first step ahead of the follower. Once the stairs finish, the guide must inform the follower that they are at the end of the stairs. As time passes and experience is gained, both the guide and the follower will become comfortable with a brief pause instead of completely stopping and performing this routine and with a minimum of verbal directions. At that advanced stage, a simple uh, statement such as stairs down or stairs up will be sufficient. The next aspect is turning around or performing an about face. This is to turn in a small space or to avoid confusing the follower. The guide must ask the follower to about turn and then turn inwards to face the follower. The guide should then offer their other arm and complete the turn once the follower has grasped their arm. The follower must face the guide after hearing the command about turn and must contact the guide's other arm. The original grasp must be released. The next aspect is changing sides before stairs or to avoid an obstacle. The guide should ask the follower to change sides by bringing their arm behind them. The follower should grasp the guide's arm with his or her hand that is free. He or she must then release their original grasp and slide that hand across the guide's back to the free arm. The follower then assumes the normal grasp position. Another aspect is handling doors. The guide should tell the follower if the door needs to be pushed or pulled and whose side the hinges are on. The guide should then begin opening the door and let the follower hold the door if required. A statement such as your door 
will alert the follower as to the need for an appropriate action. If the hinges are on the follower's side, he or she must maintain their grasp while supporting the door for themselves. If the hinges are on the guide side, the follower must place their free hand above the original grasp as if beginning to change sides. The door should then be braced with their newly freed hand. When the follower has passed through the door, the same process must be reversed and the original grasp assumed. The next aspect is walking through narrow passages. The guide should continue facing forward and move their arm diagonally across their back. The follower straightens his or her arm out and moves directly behind the guide, thus following him or her in a single file. Sitting is another aspect. To help with this, the guide must position the follower in a way that their knees touch the chair and place their hand on the back of the chair. For some followers, it may be helpful to describe the back and the arms of the chair. The follower must bend to the chair, sweep the seat with one hand, locate the arms and sit. Another important aspect is entering cars. The follower must be guided to the door handle. He or she must be indicated whether it is the front or the back door and also must be told which way the car is facing. The follower must locate the frame above the open door with one hand and the door handle with the other. They must sweep the seat with their hand before sitting and then of course buckle up the seat belts. These were some of the aspects of the sighted guide technique. Now as a bonus, I'll share with you two systematic search procedures that can enable the visually impaired to find objects that fall from their hands. There should be some preparation before executing the search procedures. The individual must listen to the hitting sound of the article and estimate the direction of the sound and its distance. They must slowly walk towards the object and stop at a distance less than what they had estimated. Squatting is an ideal search position. Once in position, then the individual must use either the circular search pattern or the column or airplane search pattern. For the circular search pattern, they should place the palm of their searching hand on the ground. The beginning point of the procedure is when the palm touches the ground. Then they must move their hand round and round the beginning point in a constantly increasing circle, just like spreading a dosa on the pan. The next search procedure is the column or aeroplane search pattern. The individual must place the palm of the searching hand in front. The hand must then be moved in a side to side direction while moving forward. Either one or both hands can be used at the same time. I am grateful to my friends who made this possible. Dabet who appears with me in the video, Indrabhai who was skillfully behind the camera and Stuti for her abundant inputs and assistance with setting up the frames and angles. Together with my friends, we are extremely grateful to Shiny Man for guiding us and giving us a free hand to choose the theme of our project. We sincerely hope this video was helpful for you. Do let us know your experiences and queries in the comment section below. Mm -hmm.